Hi and welcome to High School Physics Explained. My name is Paul and today I want to discuss uh, the nature of black body radiation and the problem it raised at the end of the 19th century which was partially resolved by the hypotheses of Max Planck. So let's get started. Now before we move on let's talk about uh, specifically uh, understanding what a black body is and what happens when uh, it absorbs energy and radiates that energy. And I want to draw your attention to something you're probably familiar with. You know that a light bulb uh, has a filament. And that filament, as you turn the electricity on, starts to glow. Now, the actual amount of current flowing through it, through it will obviously mean more brightness um, in the bulb. And you're probably aware that certainly if something is hot, it may glow bright red. But is if it gets hotter, it actually seems to change color right up to uh, a very white hot filament. And so you understand now that there is somehow a relationship between the color of the filament and the fact that the temperature is increasing. Now, strictly speaking, it's not one color that's being emitted. It's actually a whole host of colors being emitted. Now here I have just a representation of the electromagnetic spectrum in terms of light. And down the bottom, of course, we have infrared. So we understand that if something is hot or something is quite warm, it will release, obviously, heat energy, which is infrared energy, but it will also start to emit some light as well. And in this case, in the wavelengths that are the longest, in this case, red. As something gets hotter, you may find that, yes, we're still getting heat, we're still getting red light, but we start now getting a little bit more of the orange and the yellow light, and of course our eyes combine that, and it appears orange. If something gets even hotter, then in this case we have still lots of, we have infrared radiation and all these colors over here, but it's now emitting also green light as well. And again, our eyes will combine that uh, with our brains in terms of we see it as yellow. Now, if something is particularly hot, white hot, what you need to see is that we again, we are getting still the red and the oranges and the yellows, but now we're getting the smaller frequencies here up as well. And so as a result, because we're seeing the whole spectrum here, as well as the infrared radiation here that's present, we interpret that as white. So clearly there is a relationship between how much wavelengths are in, um, being emitted and the temperature. Now, um, that is ultimately uh, happens to basically any material. So my, my filament, which in most ordinary incandescent light bulbs, which is tungsten, um, it didn't, doesn't but depend on tungsten. It depends on specifically simply on the energy you put in and the heat that actually uh, is generated, or let's say the, uh, the temperature. And ultimately, any uh, substance that absorbs some energy, in, and in our previous example, that was electrical energy, and it's converted to uh, infra, uh, infrared and light, in other words, electromagnetic radiation, then they will emit that until such time they are the same temperature as their surroundings. So uh, one could even suggest that you, in one sense, are doing the same thing. Your metabolism is generating energy, and as a result, you are radiating infrared radiation. Now, that will continue, of course, until such time you are the same temperature as its surroundings. That is referred to as radiative cooling. So um, let's have a look then, basically, a little bit more at the mathematical relationship between the temperature and uh, the range of wavelengths that you might receive. So here we have a very famous curve. It's called the black body or black spectrum uh, curve. And on the y-axis, we have the intensity. And on the x-axis, we have the wavelength. And as I change the temperature, what the graph represents is the range of wavelengths that are emitted. So if I just pause it to, let's say, roughly 5,800 degrees, which is approximately the temperature of the sun, then what it shows you here is, is that we're getting a lot of infrared radiation over here, we're getting obviously light energy over here, we're getting a full range of the spectrum over here, and as a result, we would see it as white light. Now, yes, there is obviously an, a peak here, in this case in the green, but in terms of us, we don't necessarily see that particular intensity 
uh, clearly at least not with their eyes, but we're getting the full range. If I decrease the temperature, and so let's say something to a light bulb, you can see now we have, and I'll just have to adjust the scale so it becomes a bit more evident, uh, you can clearly see that there's a lot of infrared radiation emitted, and there's some light, not much at all in the smaller wavelengths, um, uh, but a lot in the red and the orange, and, and that's what is uh, quietly commonly known. So you know that a light bulb, uh, a 100 watt light bulb, at least the old style 100 watt light bulb, is about 90, 95% of the energy is uh, converted into heat energy. Well, here it is. And then a little bit is converted into light energy. And if you remember from, uh, for those who are doing the New South Wales curriculum, you know that um, uh, Wynne's Law um, states that the um, there is a relationship between the wavelength um, is proportional to 1 over the temperature. So in other words, uh, in terms of the wavelength of the peak that's right here. So um, what that is saying is, is that as I increase my temperature, the peak obviously goes obviously goes higher, but most importantly, you can see it's starting to move towards the left. And so there is an inverse relationship between the temperature and the maximum wavelength over there. So um, that's really helpful to understand. Now, the important thing, of course, is, is that when you look at that, you need to understand that the light that's given off is purely what's being converted from what it is already absorbs. In other words, if I have a light blue object over here, it's light blue not because it's hot, but it's actually because it's reflecting light. So really, if I were to heat up a blue object, that's not going to be really helpful because I'm getting some radiation that is due to reflection of uh, blue light. Uh, if it's a bit darker, there's less blue light, but nonetheless, it's not ideal. What I need is a is a perfect black substance. And that is a black substance is obviously not radiating or so not uh, reflecting any light. It's simply absorbing everything. And again, that's something you can draw to your own personal experience. If you step out into the sunshine with a black t-shirt and it's a summer's day, then you're, it's going to get very hot because it's absorbing all the light energy and then re-emitting it as a heat energy. And that's why you feel hot. But of course, no substances are perfect black bodies um, because as long as you can see them, then uh, in other words, your black t-shirt, you can see because it's reflecting a little bit light. But some good examples or analogies of black bodies would be, let's say, the stars uh, or the sun. Uh, clearly, it's not reflecting any light. It's re-emitting light of all the energy it's converting from the fusion inside it. Um, one could argue an oven is a bit like this too. Uh, you don't see the inside of the oven. Uh, it's black uh, because it's, it's basically absorbing all the energy and starts to glow only when things get hot. So a black body is simply something that um, measures, basically re-emits all its energy that is absorbed. It's a perfect emitter and an absorber of radiation. Now, here is a picture of the graph again. But um, this particular graph was a little bit of an enigma to uh, scientists at the uh, latter half of the 19th century. Uh, a scientist by the name of Rolling and Jean had developed a mathematical um, formula to describe the behavior of the um, intensity and the um, wavelength that this particular graph represents. Uh, and they got a result that really well described basically the first part of the graph, but then suddenly their mathematics um, predicted that this would continue up. In other words, as something gets hotter and hotter and hotter, you basically get more and more smaller wavelengths of much greater increasing um, intensity. And um, so in other words, you could get substances that release a lot of ultraviolet radiation and eventually x-rays and so forth. But the problem with that is, is that does not represent what we actually measure. In other words, based on classical models, that is light and all forms of EMR are a wave, then the behavior should go up like this. 
However, the actual experimental data goes like this. Now that's weird. So who is right? Is the physics right and therefore this should happen? Or is the experimental evidence right? Now obviously, clearly you're going to say the experimental evidence has got to be right. But then how do you explain the fact that the physics should go up over here? Uh, there's a real big problem here. And this aspect, the fact that the, the intensity uh, seems to, the, I should say, the, the physics or the classical physics models uh, uh, shows the major de uh, departure from the experimental evidence at the ultraviolet range. We call this the ultraviolet catastrophe because the physics broke down in terms of the experimental evidence. And there was, this was a, a, a real problem uh, at the later, latter half of the 19th century. So along comes Max Planck. And Max Planck in 1900 was perplexed by the inability of the physics uh, understanding to explain the experimental evidence of the black body radiation curve. So he offers an explanation, and what he starts thinking about is he says, well, atoms can certainly emit radiation. It's ultimately atoms are uh, releasing the electromagnetic radiation. And certainly, obviously, atoms can receive radiation. So somehow the atoms themselves are receiving radiation and then converting that into other forms of radiation like EMR. So he comes up with this radical idea. He says basically that maybe the energy is quantized. What that basically means is that energy comes in little packets. Um, and he said that energy value um, mathematically was based on the frequency multiplied by this number that he determined. And we call this Planck's constant. And you can see that the number is particularly small. And I'll just correct that, that for you. That should say a little uh, superscript over there, 10 to the negative 34. And so he basically says, look, an atom can absorb either one bit of energy or it could absorb two bits of energy, but it can never absorb one and a half bits of energy. Um, and one way of anal uh, analyzing it is a bit like this. If you go to climb a pit of stairs, um, then clearly when you go up the stairs, then you are increasing in potential energy. But clearly, as you go up, you either go up one step or two steps, but there's no way that you can climb one and a half steps. And clearly, as a result, um, we could say that our energy increases as we start climbing a staircase is quantized. It's one or two. Now, of course, if I were to have something that is like a slope, then you could say that is not quantized. But imagine if I said this line was actually at the at the microscopic level, at the nanoscale, was actually a staircase. You would say, okay, that's a smooth surface. But really what I'm saying is, no, it's not perfectly smooth. It's not continuous. It is still quantized, except that it is just really, really, really tiny, small steps. And that's in essence what Max Planck is trying to say, is that energy is quantized at the really small scale. And therefore, we would normally treat energy in terms of something that's continuous, but really at the small level, it is still quantized. So what he did was he developed a new formula, and here is that particular formula. Now, we don't need to understand the formula, but basically it's the Rolijan formula that he's reconfigured to allow for energy to be quantized. And you'll notice that the H is there for Planck's constant, and we still have a relationship of the fact that the wave, the intensity increases as the wavelength decreases and so forth, but we have this in uh, value increase like that. And so what he does is this. And so what he does, then he plots the data. And ho, lo and behold, you can see the data forms a lovely curve. And for a particular wavelength he determined with, that is exactly what he got. It matched basically what the experimental data said. Now, you think, hey, that's fantastic. He just explained the black body radiation curve. Unfortunately, no. Um, Planck basically hypothesized a mathematical solution 
to the problem. In other words, the issue of what is energy, the issue is of how does energy behave, was still governed about our understanding of classical models and that energy is a, is a wave. And Max Planck's solution to treat energy as a quantized or as a uh, set amount of value was, as he would said, an act of desperation. And in this is his quote, I knew the problem of fundamental significance for physics. I knew the formula that reproduces the energy distribution in a normal spectrum. In other words, he knew the formula fits. However, it was only a mathematical explanation and the actual theoretical interpretation had to be found. In other words, he could not marry the concept of energy being quantized with all the physics understanding or theories related to energy at the time. And um, that left a big still hole in understanding. That eventually was resolved by Albert Einstein's understanding of the photoelectric effect. That I will discuss in my next video. But I hope that was been helpful to give you an understanding of Planck's solutions to the black body radiation curve. And please subscribe to my channel. Um, thanks for listening and I hope I have helped your understanding. Bye for now.